Okay. Good morning. My name is Jerry Pete, and I am your worship associate this morning. Please, ro can't hear me. I'm doing it right now. I'm reading the thing here. Please rise as you're willing and able and join in singing hymn number 221, right, Song of Gathering. I got that. I got that. You, you, you jumped the gun. You're too anxious. <laughs> oh, you're right. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> My name is Nora Mulligan and I'm the Vice President of the Board of Trustees. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of the Hudson Valley. Whether you have been with this congregation a decade or more, or this is your first time visiting, we welcome you. Whatever the faith and traditions of your past, we welcome you. Whatever your theological stance, we welcome you. Whoever you are and whomever you love, we welcome you. Whatever your heritage, we welcome you. We respectfully acknowledge the territory on which our church building sits as the ancestral homeland of the Muncie, Lenape, and Wappinger people. We have one announcement. Josie will cover your ears. <laughs> you will see this box in the back of the church. This is, we are collecting for the staff. Put the money in the box. Sorry. <laughs> Don't hit the microphone, put the money in the box, and we will uh, distribute it as holiday bonuses for our staff. Thank you. For the most up-to-date information, please refer to our weekly e-newsletter and check our website frequently. The website is also the place where you can find contact information for our staff, <laughs> board of trustees, and other congregational leaders. And please join us for conversation after the service. If you are present in the sanctuary and the weather permits, you can join us in the parking lot. If you're watching the live stream, the link for a Zoom coffee hour can be found in the Saturday reminder in your email. 
If you are just recently joining us and would like to receive our weekly e-news, please email us with your name and we will make sure you're added to our e-news list. We can also answer any questions you might have. Email us at uucroton at gmail.com or fill out one of the yellow cards in the back of the pews and drop it in the collection plate. Josiel, Josiel. I couldn't see it, Josiel. You can uncover your ears. I could not see this, okay? <laughs> Please silent your, silence your cell phones at this time. And once again, we welcome you to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of the Hudson Valley. We gather together today out of the routines of our week to give pause, to take a deep breath, to listen to our hearts. May we be open this morning to the gift and mystery of life. May we engage this morning our ongoing quest for truth and meaning. Our chalice lighting words for this morning are by the Reverend Molly Brewer. My beloved people, I cannot pretend, and so I will not tell you that everything is okay right now, that there is no reason to be angry, that you must be optimistic or at peace. I cannot pretend these things, and so I won't tell them to you. But now our chalice is lit. And so all I ask of you in this moment is that we remember the words of Rebecca Parker. There is a love. There is a love holding us. There is a love holding all. By the light of our chalice, let us rest in this love. Right. Now please, <clears throat> okay. Now please join me in saying our unison affirmation. The words are in your order of service. Inspired by love, our mission is to seek our true nature, connect deeply and openly, and act for justice. Let us now bear witness to the joys and sorrows experienced in our community. If you have a personally significant joy or sorrow that you are willing to share, please come up to the microphone to my left, your right, and speak it loudly and clearly, so even with your mask on, we can all hear you. The microphone will allow our friends watching virtually to hear what you are saying. I will light a candle for each. When you are done speaking, please use the center aisle to return to your seat. If you would prefer only to have a candle lit without speaking, please just stand and I'll light that candle for you. Well, some of you are probably worried that I'm going to light a candle for the Michigan game yesterday. However, uh, unfortunately, I have a candle of sorrow uh, uh, for the Reverend Chuck Freeman. Um, Chuck uh, was the uh, executive director of UU Texas Justice Ministry, one of these state uh, social justice uh, things. We have one here in New York. And, and uh, Chuck li uh, lived in Austin and recently entered hospice. So... We are waiting, uh, unfortunately, for him to pass into whatever follows this life. Uh, but uh, Chuck was a dear friend, a great colleague, very uh, uh, vivacious, a lot of fun. He had an annual slot in the San Antonio church. Uh, I worked with him a lot lobbying the Texas legislature, even though we didn't win very many of those fights, um, going to baseball games in Corpus Christi, and uh, it's hard to imagine a world where Chuck won't be in it anymore. So this is for Chuck. I have a joy, I'm Kathy Williams, it was a joy yesterday to sing with a, a small combined choir of, of the Austining area um, congregations. We were led by the choir director of, of Trinity Church there in Austining on Route 9, and several of us here, Ginny Stillman, Jim Russell, Sherry Brown, Nanette Kress, and myself, and it, I think we all just loved, loved it. Sorry, 
I'm Dave Morkel. Uh, we had a bit of a tough week at work uh, this week. Uh, about three months ago, our assistant chief of EMS operations thought he had kidney stones, went to see the doctor, was diagnosed with cancer, and just entered hospice uh, just a few days ago, and, there, and he is day by day at this point. Um, and also, uh, Friday morning, uh, Vincent Moreau, who is a uh, probationary firefighter, was uh, passed away after collapsing doing functional skills training at the fire academy. Um, he never regained con consciousness. Uh, I had the, the honor of being at the hospital when he passed um, with the family and the rest of the executive staff of the fire department and part of the uh, procession down to the medical examiner's office as we, uh, we took his body down there. Um, it was just puts life into perspective. You know, it's something to think about in these strange times. But uh, it was, it, it is, will be a tough week as we prepare for his funeral this week. Also. Good morning. I'm Bernie Croft, and I'm a member of the Social Justice Committee. And this is not only my personal joy, but it's a joy for the whole congregation. I want you to know that during the recent shoe drive we had in November, we collected 200 pairs of shoes for Souls for Souls. And that's record breaking. So thank you all so much. Hi, I'm Joanne Hefner, and I have a sorrow. My sister-in-law passed away last week from a long illness with Alzheimer's. And I will miss her through. Hello, I'm Megan, and um, one of my very dear friends back in Ohio has been struggling with the care of her father um, at OSU Medical Center. Um, he's been there fighting COVID for several weeks now. We also acknowledge all the unspoken joys and sorrows held within the sanctuary of our hearts and all those people who have yet to find a spiritual home where they can share their joys and sorrows. I invite you at this time to join in the spirit of meditation. You may wish to sit up straight in your pew or wherever you are at at home. Put your feet flat on the floor to ground you to the earth. Keep your eyes open if you wish or close them and slowly take, take in a nice deep breath and gently release it, releasing all of the stress of the week. What did the Buddha say to the hot dog vendor? Make me one with everything. <laughs> but did he really mean it? Was enlightenment his goal, his realization, his swallowing the red pill, or his curse? In some sculptures, the Buddha weeps. Suzuki Roshi asks, why become enlightened? You might not like it. Feeling that much suffering is too much. Even Jesus couldn't take it on the cross. What makes me think I am ready? You think you can get there? You think you can practice all five precepts without stumbling? Avoid the ten non-virtues, perfect the six paramitas, skip down the eightfold path like Dorothy on her way to Oz? I bet not even for a day much less for the rest of your life, much less for the next five lifetimes. Even Babe Ruth only got hits a third of the time. There are no enlightened people, just enlightened activity, moving through imperfect, deluded human beings. Enlightenment is a process that we all participate in if we tune our radios to the right frequency. So let us not despair. 
but instead join in the chorus at the heart of the universe. Namo Amida Butsu, because we are already one with everything. Let us be together in a moment of silent meditation. Our reading for today is entitled Siddhartha Sees the Morning Star by Reverend Dr. Joshua Snyder. Prince Siddhartha, having become disillusioned with his life as the future king of the Shakya clan in northern India, abdicated his throne. He left the palace and was consumed with a spiritual mission to find an end to suffering. After having studied with a great many spiritual masters and becoming adept at their teachings, Siddhartha decided to go his own way. He and five others left their masters to practice on their own in the wilderness. Siddhartha and his five friends would do extreme things like eat a grain of rice and drink a drop of water every day. They would contort their bodies into uncomfortable poses. They would stare at the sun. They would do all sorts of things to demonstrate to themselves that they had abandoned the pleasures of the world. One day, on the brink of starvation, Siddhartha was walking along a river. He passed out from exhaustion, and a local goat herder found him. The young man propped up Siddhartha's head and gave him some yogurt to eat. It was the first decent meal he'd had in weeks. Soon he was revived and washed his face in the river. Siddhartha realized that starving himself to death would not accomplish his goal of being released from suffering. However, neither would the worldly delights of the palace bring him any lasting joy. The answer, he concluded, must lay in the middle way between these two extremes. So Siddhartha gathered a bundle of grass and made a cushion for himself under a large tree. He vowed, I will not rise from this place until I have conquered passion and solved the riddle of suffering. As he sat down, the demon Mara became very worried. 
Mara, you see, was the demon of desire and ignorance. Mara thrived on distraction and suffering. I must do something about this, he told himself. So Mara came to Siddhartha and asked him, but whose authority do you do this? Who will bear witness to this enlightenment you seek to attain? Siddhartha touched the ground with his hand and the earth shook in 10 directions. And a voice emerged from the ground. I will bear witness. All creation bears witness to this grand event. Discouraged but not unbeaten, Mara sent his daughters to, send, to tempt Siddhartha away from his goal. Mara's daughters were beautiful and flirted with Siddhartha. But he saw the daughters of Mara for what they were, an illusion. Siddhartha snapped his fingers, and the women were revealed to be cobras and other monstrous creatures. Mara then turned to his sons and told them to attack Siddhartha. The sons of Mara shot their arrows at him, but Siddhartha again snapped his fingers, and the arrows were transformed into flowers, which harmlessly rained down around Siddhartha. Having de been defeated for the final time, Mara withdrew, knowing that Siddhartha would attain his goal. Siddhartha began meditating during the first watch of the night. During this period, he saw all of his previous lives. He saw himself as a god, as a demon, as an animal. Then in the second watch of the night, he saw the previous lives of all beings. He saw how all of them had suffered as a result of old age, sickness, and death. Lastly, in the third watch of the night, Siddhartha realized that at the root of suffering lay three common characteristics, delusion, hatred, and desire. When the third watch of the night was over and dawn was about to break, Siddhartha saw the morning star rise in the east. Suddenly, in that moment, he let go of all delusion, hatred, and desire that had plagued him throughout his many lifetimes. He was free, and he had become enlightened. He was the Buddha. Uh, please rise as you are willing and able, and join me in hymn number 1051 in your Teal hymn book. It, you have a link if you're at home in your electronic order of service. It's called We Are. I've been asked to help out a little on this one. <laughs> um, just for those of you who are reading along there, um, the first repeat and the last repeat we're doing, but not that middle repeat, okay? You'll see. For each child that's born, the morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. For each child that's born, the morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. We are our grandmother's prayers, and we are our grandfather's dreamings. We are the breath of our ancestors. We are the spirit of we are mothers of courage and fathers of time. We are daughters of dust and the sons of great visions. We're sisters of mercy and brothers of love. We are lovers of life and the builders of nations. We're seekers of truth and keepers of faith. We are makers of peace and the wisdom of ages. We are our grandmother's prayers, and we are our grandfather's dreamings. We are the breath of our ancestors. We are the spirit of God. For each child that's born, a mortal 
shining star rises and sings to the universe who we are for each child that's born a morning star rises and sings to the universe who December is a time for celebration. Christmas and New Year's are the most well-known of this time of year, but there are lots of others. And as Unitarian Universalists, we honor the wisdom of all religious traditions, great and small. However, if we tried to celebrate them all equally, we would quickly tire ourselves out. But that just because we can't get to all of them doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to at least learn from a few of those other traditions. One of the holidays that happens early in December, just a few days away from us now on December 8th, uh, is Rohatsu, or the Buddha's Enlightenment Day. In just about all Zen traditions that I've been a part of, the Buddha's Enlightenment is celebrated with a seven-day silent retreat, usually the longest of the year. It culminates on December 8th when all retreat participants meditate throughout the entire night, just as the Buddha did. Although, you can take breaks and you can leave if you want to at certain points, but most folks are good till about 4 o'clock in the morning. I love this particular holiday for a couple reasons. One is it happens early in this kind of so-called holiday season. And for another, it's, it's sort of countercultural to how we think of those December holidays. Usually there's gifts and there's parties and drinking, none of which I have any problem with, if you do so responsibly. Uh, uh, our Roman ancestors who celebrated Saturnalia would be proud, but a solid month of that gets to be a little much. I'm not against a party, but starting the season off with silence and self-discipline sets a nice tone for those festivities. I particularly started feeling this way, uh, the pressure of the holidays, about the time that I became a parent. Nothing adds to the stress of the holidays than raised expectations. Let me tell you, you have not seen capitalism in action until you've sat down and watched cartoons uh, intended for children specifically the commercials. It's amazing and frankly kind of horrifying uh, thing to watch w when you think about it too much, which I often do. Scenes of kids playing with toys, cars, dolls, all of them as happy as can be. Now kids of course take this at face value. They don't have the filters that we do as adults. Once when I myself was on the verge of adolescence. I asked for some trucks for my birthday. These trucks you see had, uh, hard to describe, but they had canonical hubcaps so that you could tip them on, on their tires and they would kind of lean like that. Uh, and they would still roll forward even though they were kind of at an angle. It was rather clever actually. And I remember the kids in this commercial for these trucks we're just having a grand time playing with these things. And I was sold. I asked uh, for and got, I, I don't remember, two or three of these trucks for my birthday. But there was a catch. From the looks in the commercial, these trucks looked like they were, I don't know, six or seven inches tall, kind of substantial. But when I got them, they were about the size of a matchbox car, maybe even a little smaller, as I recall. <laughs> They were teeny tiny, and I was so disappointed. I, I suppose they worked as they did on the TV. It wasn't like they were broken or anything, but I remember feeling like a real sucker uh, uh, for being fooled like that as a little kid. That is, I guess, the downside to hope. If we're talking about hope in the sense of what we'll get for Christmas or Hanukkah, then that's a rather tenuous hope. 
Indeed. If that's our hope, then our, our happiness is contingent on material goods. We have made our happiness external to ourselves. Now, advertisers do this very intentionally. They try to make us feel something, feel old or ugly or fat or unhappy. And the only way you can feel better is to buy their thing. Or in the case of my kids, convince your parents to buy you that thing. Most of the kids I know don't even really like the food at McDonald's. Uh, uh, but man, they've got a toy in that box. And, and that's what they really want. And they say, oh, well, you, gotta, you can't just get one. You gotta collect four or five in the series, right? So you gotta keep going back to McDonald's every week so that you get uh, all of these things because they interlock and make some bigger toy. I don't know. So that when I'm going, I'm going back to this week after week in order to collect them all, you really have to admire the genius behind the evil. <laughs> now hope can be superficial and materialistic this time of year, no doubt about that, but hope is so much more. It feels, uh, uh, in our story this morning, Siddhartha is the paragon of hope. He feels deeply the suffering of the world, both within himself and among the people he loves. Old age, sickness, and death come to everyone. How do we react to those realities? Usually with suffering, wanting life to turn out some way that we want it to turn out. And if you were a spiritually advanced person in Siddhartha's time, you were able to at least understand the problems of old age sickness and death and what those problems they presented. But no one had yet figured out how to solve that problem of suffering. Siddhartha desperately wanted to do so. He needed to solve the problem of suffering. It's interesting, Buddhism starts with the book of Job rather than creation. Uh, it starts with the problem of evil and suffering. That's what he hoped for. Enlightenment was his ultimate hope. Siddhartha in Sanskrit means he who will accomplish his goal. Now, of course, we know that he did, or at the very least, the religion that emerged after him claims that he did. Now, it's hard to describe enlightenment, obviously, certainly since I've not really had it. Uh, many would say that it is impossible. It's something that you experience. It's not even something you can talk about. It's beyond all of our conceptual words and images. But as the great Zen master uh, Dainin Katagiri Roshi once said, you have to say something. I believe that enlightenment is the ability to hold two fundamental truths in tension. It's to live within a, a paradox. On the one hand, it's an experience that everything and everyone is connected. We're all a unity. To use the language of that tradition, we are empty of our individual selves. There is no ghost in the machine, but rather a series of highly complex processes that flow back and forth between each other. On the other hand, enlightenment is also an experience of every aspect of your being, every nuance of your personal mind, heart, and body. It is to experience the holy within yourself in your own infinite particularity and nuance. One of the realm, one is the realm of form, the other the realm of the formless. One is not better than the other, they go together. In a way, one's the first principle, the inherent worth and dignity of every person, and the other is the interdependent web of which we are all a part. Now, all of this kind of comes to Siddhartha in a, in a flash of insight when he sees that morning star emerge just before the coming dawn, which we now know is the planet Venus. Siddhartha had lived up to his name and had accomplished his goal in that moment. His hope of ending his own suffering and had come to pass. And according to tradition, the Buddha sat under the Bodhi tree for a couple of weeks, just kind of reveling in the mystical joy of enlightenment. He was basking in the glow of it, as we might say. Uh, kind of, I guess, taking a spiritual victory lap or something like that. 
Finally, Brahma, the king of all the gods in the Hindu pantheon, comes down to the Buddha and pleads to him, please get up, share your teachings, don't be selfish. There are suffering beings all over this world and, and in the next, and, and you have to help them out. At first, the Buddha refuses. Now it's too profound, too subtle a truth for other people to understand. And as they do in these stories often, <laughs> Brahma has to ask three times. Something about that, I don't really understand it. But he asks three times, begs the Buddha to get up and share his teachings. And finally, of course, the Buddha relents and agrees to do so. Someone will understand the truth that lies within us. And uh, teach he did. Actually, his five companions that you heard about in the story are the first five people he uh, uh, teaches. One of the main subjects of that first sermon was the path to happiness. Basically, the Buddha says that happiness is to be found within ourselves. Oh, we may get pretty good at fooling ourselves into believing that it's out there somewhere to be chased after at the bottom of a bottle, in drugs, dysfunctional relationship, trying to control people, buying a gun because you're afraid, not taking care of ourselves, or consuming and consuming and consuming until there is nothing left of this good earth. These are all distractions, he says, because happiness, hope, joy, the end of suffering is an internal process. Personally, that's a holiday message that gives me hope. Now, make no mistake, I'm only slightly better uh, now than I was when I was taken in by that TV ad about the trucks that roll on their side. Uh, only now, instead of for myself, the holidays are about providing enough for the kids, food for the dinner, cards to the family out of state. Desire and expectations abound. But Buddha reminds us that we we shouldn't let all those desires and expectations hook us. Those are hopes of a certain kind, but there are other, bigger, more meaningful things to hope for this holiday season. One of my fondest memories is, holiday memories, is from my sophomore year of college. One of the many stops on my spiritual journey before I found Unitarian Universalism was the United Methodist Church. Uh, and I got very active in the campus ministry that the Methodists do called the Wesley Foundation. Many of my closest friends from college I know from there and I met there and uh, continue to uh, be my friends even though I was UU. Indeed, that was the first time someone whispered to me the idea of becoming a minister. And one of the traditions that we had the holiday party was at the home of the, the Methodist chaplain. He was a minister, but he, his ministry was just to this campus ministry. Uh, and he and his wife, who was a very good piano player and singer, would invite us over to a party uh, on a night when exams were kind of done or nearly done, but we had not yet scattered to the four winds uh, to be home with our families. And when the cookies had been eaten and the punch mostly consumed, Remember, these were teetotaling Methodists. There's no alcohol to be found there. We would gather around the piano and sing carols. And it was one year that we were in the middle of singing O Holy Night that I had just a brief moment of transcendence. It's hard to describe, though I don't think it was on par with what the Buddha experienced. It was just a, a feeling that everything in that moment was perfect and fit together into a, into a neat whole. The people, the holiday decorations, our voices harmonizing in song. It was the feeling of, yes, this is what Christmas is all about. So when we talk about hope during the holidays, having that experience of community, I think, is one of those hopes. Of course, the temptation is to make an idol out of it, to try to recreate the conditions, the, the snow, my friends, the song, that all went into that moment of clarity and grace. And if so, 
then I would have made that precious holiday memory yet another item on my holiday wish list, something to strive for and be disappointed that it never comes to pass again this year. That is, if we're fooled by the external trappings. In point of fact, all those factors were important, but not the thing in and of itself. They're important because they unlocked something deep in my heart and soul that I had not experienced before. How to do that without driving myself crazy with another layer of expectations and demands on the self, I think is the secret to holiday happiness. But one thing I suspect is that it was not coincidence that this feeling happened while in community with people I cared about. I now believe that hope is not something that is given to us. It's not merely a wish that Santa Claus or the Great Pumpkin will bring us everything our greedy little hearts desire. That might be nice for a while, but euphoria, that euphoria fades. Rather, hope is a perspective. It's a frame of mind that we intentionally cultivate. Hope is a spiritual practice that we coax out of ourselves, not something handed to us by someone else. Hope is finding a light in a world filled with darkness. No, matter, no wonder it's associated with holidays like Christmas and Hanukkah and solstice that remind us that in these dark days of winter, there is, the sun will return. The light will continue to grow. Hope is a way of viewing the world when the world's going crazy. I think of that this past week uh, when violence has become a kind of fetish for some people. The violence and death in Michigan, yet another shooting. Fear, anger, and negativity have become all too common for us. And when you add guns to the mix, then you produce a deadly stew. Of course, none of this is new to you or to us. But let me tell you something you probably didn't get from news reports and talk shows. Hope will not be handed out. Hope is looking at our messed up world and still loving it. It's to hold the hatred and the pain and the violence and still articulate a world that can be made whole by love. Hope is a way of seeing the world not with unrealistic wishes, but with creative ways to live a life of compassion for everyone without exception. That way of seeing the world framed by hope is the result of hard work. It's a spiritual discipline that comes from within. Only when we pause from our chasing the latest and greatest shiny bauble in the window and dare to look within ourselves will we find a wellspring of hope within our breast that can sustain us through the hard night. We become the candle in that cold, dark world, reminding people that warmth and light and life of the sun has not abandoned us. This is not an easy task. So how do we go about doing it? Well, at the risk of being a shameless shill for Buddhism, uh, I suggest taking a little cue from our friend Siddhartha, or at least a little bit of that practice of Rohatsu. Meditating all night is probably a little bit much. Uh, that's, a, that's like trying to get in shape by taking up jogging and then trying to run a marathon the very first day. But what about five minutes? Take five minutes out of your day every day between now and January 2nd, or whenever you feel the holidays are done for you. And in those five minutes, I invite you to do one or both of the following. Just pay attention to your breathing, how it flows in and out of your body. Feel the muscles in your chest and the abdomen as you pull in and expel air. Sit in a chair, no fancy postures are necessary. And then if you get bored with that, try this practice. Ask yourself, what has me hooked? 
What is it about this time of year that has you worried or anxious or nervous or angry? Name it. Lean into it rather than away from it. What part of that experience hooks you and gets you upset? What would not getting hooked by holiday expectations look like? Would it really be so bad if the tree was not perfect, the turkey a little dry, or the kids had one less toy? Now, I'm not so naive as to tell you to be a Buddhist monk this holiday season. That might be, as I say, a bit too extreme. I think if the Buddha were here, he would probably tell us to be balanced. Stri strive to find a balance between that crazy stress of the holidays and the simple quiet of Rohatsu, the Buddha's enlightenment. May this time be a season of hope. May we cultivate hope as a way of viewing our world with compassion, even as hatred and violence become all too common. And may we strive ever for a balance, for inner peace and happiness. May you be ever hopeful. I love you. Go in peace. Amen. I invite you now to join in singing one of the few Buddhist hymns in our hymnal, uh, number 183, The Wind of Change Forever Blown. Each week, we make an offering from the bounty we are blessed to enjoy. We do this in a spirit of love and generosity, aware that we have benefited from those who have gone before, those who in their turn gave generously. Our offering goes to support the work of love and justice undertaken by this community. Today's offering will be shared with the Croton Cortland Pantry. Please refer to our e-newsletter or website for more information. You can make your donation in several ways. 
If present in the sanctuary, you may give cash or a check in the offering plate as it comes by. <clears throat> you may also scan the Q code in your order of service. From your homes, you may make your donation via credit card or PayPal using the links provided in the e-newsletter. Please remember to give it a little extra to compensate for the 3% surcharge, or if you prefer, you can always mail us a check. The offering will now be given and gratefully received. Please join me in the dedication of the offering. The words are in your orders of, order of service. May these gifts and the work of our hands and hearts give power to all we stand for as a community of faith. Now please join me in ext extinguishing the chalice. The words are also in your order of service. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. <laughs> Thought that thing was gonna stay on for eight days. These words of benediction are from my friend and mentor, Burton Carley. May the pet meditation of our hearts May the hymns of our spirit, may the wisdom of our thoughts, may the joy of our worship nurture us in the week ahead so that they may live, so that we may live our lives with dignity, love, and courage. Go in peace.